As we discuss just about every day on the show, it feels like there's more outrage than ever about the goings-on in Washington on both sides of the aisle. And while some might argue that's because we're a more partisan nation in general, others point out it's also because we know a lot more about what's happening in our government on a day-to-day -day basis thanks to the Internet. And yet my guest argues a faster Internet could lead to a stronger, more prosperous nation, but we're doing it wrong and falling woefully behind. The book is Fiber, The Coming Tech Revolution and Why America Might Miss It. The author, Susan Crawford, joins me now. I should add, she's also a Harvard Law professor, Wired contributor, and co-head of the FCC transition team from Bush to Obama. Susan, it's good to meet you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jim. Can we start with the real basics? Fiber optic versus basic cable. Give us a little Cliff Notes thing, could you? Fiber is basically magical. It has unlimited capacity. Once you've got the glass in the ground, that's all it is, very, very pure glass, and you send light through it, you can just upgrade the electronics at the end of the glass, once the glass is there, and carry, we believe, an infinite amount of information, infinitely upgradable. So why, like, why does it matter so much that we are falling behind? You'll make the case that we are, you make it really compellingly and sadly in your book. Why does it matter that we're so far behind? Mike? computer's pretty fast. I'm pretty happy. Just talk to people in western Massachusetts who don't have adequate internet access. It's like not being able to breathe. It's like not having clean water. It's like not having a functioning electricity grid. We're, at, we're in such a bad state in America when it comes to internet access. And we don't travel, so we don't see the other countries that are doing this really well. They never wait. Everything works. It's cheap. There's tons of competition, and we could have gotten there, but we made a bunch of policy mistakes over the last 20 years. And you make it mostly in Asia, or a lot of it in a Asia. A lot, and Northern Europe. There's some statistic you have that China's installing 20... Thousand last mile fiber connections every single day. Compare that to us. How many are we doing every and day? And actually, since the book was put to press, yeah. China has announced they're going to connect 80% of their homes to fiber. And we're maybe 20% if the wind is blowing. And, and that's a huge market. So that creates this sandbox for all the new developments of the world. So let me, this is the time for my naive question of yeah. the interview. The line from your book that's been most quoted so far, I will read to you. Ah. Fiber plus advanced wireless capacity is a central to the next phase of human existence as electricity was a hundred years ago. It's not a very grand statement. <laughs> okay, so you make that thing. So here's the naive question. If you know how important it is in the grand scheme of things, I assume some CEOs know the same thing. So why are the Comcast and the Verizons of the world not following your uh, uh, directive? I'm serious about that. That's the naive <laughs> part, really. Comcast has no particular incentive to you know, spend a lot of money upgrading their existing cable networks. They're not fiber, they're cable. Mm -hmm. And they, that's not going to be as upgradable. And they can charge whatever they want. They're usually not pressured by competition or oversight. So in Cambridge, your only choice is Comcast. That's I know it. that very well. Yeah. So you know, but, but they're not worried. These leaders, I understand, as long as they can tamp it down and their competition is not getting ahead right. of them. Are they worried about the rest of the world getting ahead of them? Or does that not matter? We can be an island, according to them, and that island will be fine for them as a business proposition? They're accountable to their shareholders, mm -hmm. and their shareholders want to keep those returns as high as possible. So it's it's a good deal to be a private mm -hmm. monopoly. It's extremely lucrative. It's a very quiet life. So when we say uh, these puerile things, like the one thing that the Democrats and Trump can agree upon mm -hmm. is a trillion dollar infrastructure mm -hmm. a plan, I have to say, well, I haven't read every line of what the Democrats or the president has said. I never hear in that trillion dollars that fiber optic is part of the infrastructure proposal. Is it? Is anybody championing that? I mean, you talk about how electricity was obviously championed by the FDRs and all those right, sort right. of people. Is there a champion here? Or when we talk infrastructure, our leaders, are they talking in the most fundamental, basic, concrete, and I mean that as a pun, mm -hmm. kind of way? Well, this is the great part of the story. There are a thousand leaders. There are more than 700 mayors and community leaders and agricultural cooperative leaders who are very interested in fiber and putting in fiber networks all over the country. So we're at the beginning of the electrification analogy. We haven't yet seen the national leader. It might be Angus King, independent senator from, from Maine. Maine. This is not a right-left issue. There are tons of conservatives who are very interested in this, but they haven't come to the fore nationally but, yet. But when you mention those 700 uh, communities, and by the yeah. way, you sound a little bit like Bill McKibben was sitting here you know, a couple yeah. of months ago and said the federal government is not going to do it. S uh, states and cities right. and towns have. But we'll all be dead, it seems to me. <laughs> I mean, Otis, Massachusetts is yeah. the local example. I looked it up before he got here. 1,549 people. And while congratulations to Otis, mm -hmm. it's not exactly a metropolis that has decided unilaterally <laughs> to embrace fiber optic on their own, okay, right? Okay, so look at Lexington, Kentucky. Look at 
Chattanooga, Tennessee. Look at actually San Francisco was on the verge of doing this, but then the mayor died. So, so why are why are the Lexingtons and the Chattanoogas doing this in so many other major American cities? Apparently, don't get it. Why? The political cost of taking on this issue for any short-term mayor is extraordinary because the people who have the franchises to sell cable are going to be putting in a lot of money to defeat a mayor that takes this on. So it's usually places that are smaller right now that have the guts to, to get involved. So if you were the czar, let's say, or czarina, yeah. whatever you, you were, of, uh, of fiber optic, yeah. uh, what would you do tomorrow nationally, not city by city, not the 700 thing? What would you do nationally that would, let's say, pass the laugh test in terms of what Democrats and Republicans could live with and could afford? What would you do? Oh, it, actually, the solution to this is relatively simple. What's it that? takes lowering the cost of capital. It's just about money. This has to be patient capital. It's expensive to build these systems, and they pay back, but over a long period of time. That's why the private companies, by the way, aren't interested in doing this. Their shareholders want very fast returns. So what you do is get the states, in fact, the really great actor here might be the Fed, to guarantee loans, lower the cost of capital for particularly open fiber systems, so wholesale access on which lots of competition can emerge. Can you do a little Nostradamus thing? Let's assume we yeah. continue down the wrong path that you suggest we are, and let's go 10 years out. Yeah. When the South Koreas and the Chinas and the Japans and the Singapores and the, the Northern Europe or wherever portion of you, yeah. what does that mean? for us. We become like Rome, nice place to visit. <laughs> you know, it's already from the Korean standpoint. It's is that like, hyperbolic or do you actually? Uh, well, I am a little. Look at our trains. It's all part and parcel with a whole bunch of issues on which the country needs to make progress. And actually, the point of the book is that being able to think about fiber carries with it the ability to think about inequality, health care, all these things that everybody needs for a, a Did you say trains life. a minute ago? I sure did. Because Graham Allison, one of your colleagues at yeah. Harvard, made a great point about that. Too. Before you go, can, I hate lightning rounds. Can we do a quick one, though, because of your FCC connection? <laughs> okay. Net neutrality repeal. Give me a sentence. Uh, basically, net neutrality is a tiny issue. The, the much bigger issue is to hang on to classifying these guys as utilities. And that's what we have to win. How about the ability of the cable companies to no longer fund community access stuff? Uh, is that matter, or is that just a small local issue? In your Look, estimation? with ample connectivity, the gear is getting cheaper and cheaper. So I don't see that as an enormous hurdle. To in fact, what's happening? Cities are being bought off by these tiny uh -huh. gifts, so they don't get involved. And, in, and let's say on Ajit Pai, what do you say about him? He wants to be involved in politics in Virginia, and he's doing all he can to get there. Great, Susan. Thanks so much. Your Thank book you, is terrific. Pleasure Appreciate to meet it. You. Thanks Thank so you. much. Again, the book is Fiber: The Coming Tech Revolution and Why America Might Miss It.